Hello everybody, it's Lee back down in the basement lab. Well, I say lab, it's kind of my work from home office, but I identify it as my lab, which is which is good because it, it sounds nice and it rhymes with Lee. What I have today is really interesting. I have been looking on eBay for one of these for a little while and I found one and it is a Telenza remote lamp post control device. And these are particularly interesting because there are various conspiracies going around on YouTube and the internet and Facebook and so on that these are some kind of zippy zappy weapon mass mind control who knows what kind of thing gets attached to these now. So I thought well you know what let's buy one and see what's inside. And so here it is. This is the device. I have just received it this morning from the post and so I thought well let's do a live opening of the package and see what we have inside and maybe just take it a bit very quickly and have a quick look and then I will continue with the rest of the tear down a bit later on. So let's see if we can get this thing apart. It's uh, adequately uh, encompassed in bits of cardboard and stuff so I'll try and open it up without uh, um, impaling myself with knife and stuff. Here we go. So this is just from a, a, a standard eBay seller I and mean, they have all sorts of other weird unrelated stuff so I who knows where they got these things from. I'd imagine that somebody in the eBay seller household is somehow involved in this kind of stuff and they had some spare and thought well you know let's stick him on eBay and make some money for Christmas which is not a bad idea really because we all need a bit of a, uh, a top up at Christmas to buy I don't know beer I guess presents as well. Oh dear, pull it a bit swell. It's definitely what it said it is. Here we are. And, oh, it looks like it's a brand new one in a plastic bag as well. Absolutely fantastic. So, uh, it's got all the, um, what's the IDs on? This is, you can get the manual for these off the FCC website. And these are the IDs that you stick into the Telenza central management system to get the uh, device on the wireless network. Uh, these devices come in a few flavours. Basically, they're the same kind of thing, but this one attaches to a, a lamppost uh, that hasn't got one of the existing little uh, sort of sit-on-top photo cells on, uh, which normally just unplug. So somebody's got a little plug on, and you'd unplug the photo cell, and you put this on top instead. Uh, so this is designed to be built into lampposts without those, probably actually the new fitting. So uh, you might buy a new fitting with one of these already on it. Uh, so let's see how we can take it a bit. So it might be easier if I just uncoil all these wires here. Uh, I'm not quite sure why there are so many cables coming out of this one. The, the Harvard engineering version that I have here just had three wires. Uh, that was uh, the main supply and the live switched output. Uh, it could be that this is actually a device that has a dimming capability, so it can dim the LED lights as well. Or it might be that it's uh, able to control multiple light fittings from one device. So, you know, maybe you've got a street lamp, it's got, got the, the two arms sticking out and they've got two lights on for those kind of things. For example, uh, how do you get inside it is, uh, is an interesting question. It's very, very tightly put together, this. Um, it's probably not actually designed for uh, user servicing, so it might be interesting to get into, and it might require some brute force and ignorance. Do I have a sticky in thing somewhere um, in my tool collection, which is uh, not particularly well organized. It's kind of, uh, sort of spread out on the desk here. One moment, please. I will be right back with the appropriate tooling. Right, so I have now some appropriately inappropriate tools to get into this thing. What it looks like is these um, these little bits here are sort of at a bit of a slant, so the device clearly sort of slots in there and it's never intended to unslot again. So it looks like this will be a somewhat destructive teardown, which is fine because, let's face it, I'm never going to use it for what it was actually intended to be used for. Uh, so what I'll do is if I just... Oh, that's a... That spits very nicely there, thank you very much. And if I do that same place here, what I'll do is if I just see if I can remove those um, 
these bits here. There we are. Oh, that uh, came away quite satisfyingly. Uh, if I do that to at least two, that should allow me to get into it, which would be very nice. And down there as well. So I'll just, oh, oh dear, that split the whole thing. Ugh. That's that, isn't it? Uh, can I take, there we are, that's off as well. No, that's looking very promising. There, okay, so. Uh, right, I'll just dispose of these bits before they end up in my foot. And let's look inside. All I'm hoping is inside here is the uh, the antenna that I've seen on some videos on the YouTube, which express various theories about these devices, uh, is a, if I draw from the top view, it's like a, a, a bit like that, and uh, it's like that, and then there's a, a circle like that. So that's the top view of the antenna. And then the side view is just like that, and the little bit that's cut out of the slot there, so it angles down onto the circuit board with all the bits on. Uh, you might have seen that antenna on a video somewhere. That's what I hope is inside here. Uh, if it is, what I want to do is to put it on my antenna test rig and we'll test it because the claim is that in the direction of the slot here, it is some kind of high gain an directional antenna, um, which it um, probably isn't. So let's have a look. Yes. So we have it. This is actually a very interesting device um, because it has all the exciting components on that uh, you might have seen in some other videos. Uh, so this is fantastic and I will very much enjoy tearing this down to see what's inside it. But just to run you through, through quickly what the, the exciting bits are, <laughs> is uh, uh, they are as follows. This is a, a relay. It's a rated here at 3.3 kilowatts. Uh, so 3,300 watts, that's not the exact rating. If you look at the data sheet, it's, uh, uh, that is not the entire story there. Uh, we also have these uh, very, very famous here, 450 volt capacitors. There is a couple of those there, uh, which is good. We have a GPS antenna here, and we have here a very exciting, this is a, a super capacitor. So uh, that is... Um, this is going to be very interesting indeed. And uh, right, yeah, well, let's see if we can um, get off a little thing here because there's, there's a few bits underneath as well. What I, what I want to do is find out what the relay is connected to. So uh, when that relay switches on or off, what is it switching on or off? Is it switching on or off something on here, uh, something connected to this antenna here? Uh, or is it the, um, the cables here which go to the light fitting? I want to look at what this chip is here. Uh, it's, it says it's an ARM. Um, oh, it is an, an STM32 microcontroller, which is fantastic. You can get those. These are very popular devices. Uh, you can get little circuit boards uh, from eBay and Amazon, which have these on for you to play with at home and make all sorts of little home um, control things and robots, that kind of stuff. Uh, what should be under here somewhere as well is a an RF chip, which will actually be the transceiver chip for the antenna here. Uh, can I, I don't want to be quite as destructive. Can I, do a bit of, yeah, I think if I pull these clips back, the whole board should just lift out somehow. Oh, there we are. I don't want to destroy it because I want to make sure I can see it working and doing things. So if I can push those cables in a bit, oh, there we are. it's just going to go into a little bit. There's a rubber bung here, which makes the whole thing pretty water and moisture proof, which is excellent. Uh, uh -huh. that, that one, that clip is off. A bit more of that wire push through. Aha, here we are. Beautiful. So there it is in all its glory. I'll just get rid of the um, that bit there. And can I pull that rubber bung off, do you think? Ugh. No, I'll leave it there for now. Great on the bottom. So directly under the GPS chip here, we have what is probably the GPS receiver circuitry here and looks like here we have what might be i don't know it might be the um the rf chip for the antenna or well, that might be coming from from here excellent right what i'll do is i will identify all the um interesting looking uh, ic's on here 
uh, which will be basically that one there, um, these two here, and uh, that one there, which looks like probably part of the power supply. Uh, I will give you some details of these here, uh, the STM32, and then we will do a bit more of a uh, in-depth teardown of this device and see what makes it tick and see what it can do for us. Uh, so bear with me, hang on just a few minutes. Uh, actually, you don't need to because I'll just cut the video and edit it in in a minute. Uh, but I'll be right back. So block diagram reverse engineering is complete and there are a, um, a couple of interesting surprises on this board here. But let's start by, we'll go around clockwise here and I'll just talk through the devices as we come across them. Uh, we might say this bit here for later because this is where the interesting surprises. All the devices centre around this SEM32 microcontroller, which is what you'd expect, that's fine. One uh, little surprise, which I wasn't quite expecting, but it, it makes sense when you think about it, is that this chip here with the uh, little inductor antenna here, which is uh, the RFID chip, is actually being used for NSC. NSC is Near Field Communications. And what that means is that when an engineer installs this, and we need to provision it onto the network, so onto the wireless network, you need potentially some uh, encryption certificates, uh, uh, keys, logins, password, etc. for it to access the wireless network. That is provisioned by, potentially by an Android mobile phone and an app, which you'd hold your phone near it, um, a bit like that, and it'd go beep. And uh, that would then transfer that data into the chip here, uh, via the chip there, into the microcontroller. And that would provision whatever you need to provision to get this device onto the network. Next, we have the flash memory here. So that is just the storing configuration parameters and uh, potentially software as well. The big device on the back over here, uh, that device there, that is a SI4463 general purpose RF chip, as we, we've seen already, 100 milliwatt maximum output. The devices around it are a few extra components. You, you can use this device on its own. It's fine. It will work, but they've uh, augmented it a bit. Uh, what we have here, that is the antenna on the top, this one here. The little black IC there is this one here. That is basically a, a switching relay, uh, but for RF signals. And the reason we have that switch there, the RF switch, is the chip here has two connections, so the antenna one transmit and one receive. And if they both just connected to the antenna, then when you transmit, the signal will go up to the antenna, uh, back down here, and essentially short out and probably damage the devices here. So there's a switch here, so when it transmits, it switches the antenna to the transmit pin, and when it's receiving, it switches it to the receive pin here. The other two devices here, this one here, and the little tiny, tiny black device down there, that is a, first is a saw filter, that's a filter here, and that is a low noise amplifier, basically a receive signal amplifier. The filter is here because this is, runs on 868, 869 megahertz, and that is just above the mobile phone allocation of about 800 megahertz. And uh, that goes, I believe, up to about 820 megahertz. But there are other devices on 800 megahertz that transmit more power than this does. And what could happen is, if this is installed on a lamppost or a light fitting, which is near somebody using a mobile phone, or near a mobile phone small cell or a base station, or any other device that transmits around 800 to 900 megahertz, then potentially that transmitter would swamp the receiver here and the receiver would not be able to receive the very low signals from the controller unit. A bit like if you're trying to hear somebody whisper into your ear and there's somebody shouting right next to you, you can't understand the whisper because of the shouting. Basically, that device here, that saw filter, gets rid of all the shouting and only lets the whisper come through so that you can receive that signal properly. Next here is that chip there, which is the... Um, uh, Skytrack V815 GPS receiver, that's just a very common GPS receiver. You see it just connects up to the GPS antenna under here. Uh, if we ignore the uh, this bit for now and we move on to the LED dimmer controller, that is the grey and violet cable here out of the Telenza unit. They go to LED dimmer controllers or plenty of other lamp dimmer controllers and there's some kind of standard, which I don't know much about, which this uses to signal how bright or how dim you want that um, that lighting to be. And 
the circuit used for that is just under here. Uh, what's interesting is that those outputs are isolated here with these two opto isolators. So if anything nasty happens, then you won't get some um, spikes and mains voltage down these cables here. So devices either end of these will be protected from anything untoward happening. I mean, I say protected, these are blow up, so the device is probably tripped in the bin anyway, but um, uh, there is at least some protection there. So we come to the, the interesting power control bit. Now, as I said in the intro to this video, the power is quite basic in one way. So what happens is the power comes in the live connection here and it goes via the relay switch to the live out. And that's just like a, a, a light switch where it's either turned on or it's turned off. Uh, the output from the relay doesn't go anywhere near the antenna uh, on the circuit. There's no high power anything here. It's just switching the light on and off. There's some interesting relay driving circuitry here because this is a latching relay. And I'm, I'll put up a video about latching relays in just a minute. But essentially, a normal relay, you apply power and it turns on and you remove power from the relay coil and it turns the relay off. This relay latches, so when you apply power in one polarity with positive here and negative here, uh, then it will turn on. And then when you switch the polarity around, then it turns off again. But you only need to apply the power uh, uh, for, for maybe half a second or so. So you apply power, the relay latches on, and then you apply power the other way, and the relay turns off and latches off. Uh, so that's all very well and good. There is a extra device here. This um, The chip here is a 1N, 29N, and that is basically an electric meter chip. You might find it in uh, your sort of smart power meter home, or if you have a, uh, a non-connected, non-smart, but digital electric meter, it will have a device like that or very similar in. I have some of these devices. I've got some little uh, circuit breaker replacements you fit into your distribution board at home, but they also measure power. So you can measure the voltage and the power that's been drawn on that circuit. They have actually those exact same devices in. And the way it measures the current going out of the, the live output here is that the current goes into this shunt here from the live, through the shunt and out to the live output. And I, this is basically the same device as they have in the Harvard Engineering lighting controller. And what the chip here does is there's two tiny tracks here that go from the shunt to the chip. It measures the voltage across that shunt and from that voltage it derives how much power the light fitting is using. But this is where it gets a bit strange. So I was looking at the devices here and it appears there are actually two power supplies in this device. There's a fairly standard switch mode power supply here and that is supplying power to all the other devices around here at 3.3 volts, uh, which is absolutely fine. But then there's a collection of um, components here and down here there is a LED driver chip. And I thought, well, maybe maybe we're using the LED driver to derive power for the rest of the circuitry here, but that's not really an appropriate use of an LED driver chip, which is certainly constant current. Uh, so I, I found this device. It is indeed an LED driver, and the configuration we have here is a fairly typical configuration for a uh, 54 4 volt, 110 milliamp constant current power supply. But what's it supplying power to? And that is the, the question here, because the, the track seems to disappear on the bottom, and I'm not able to find out where it goes. Uh, apart from there appears to be a connection from the output side into the, the live out here, which is somewhat curious, because uh, why would you have that? That doesn't seem to be a particularly sensible thing to do. Uh, but it's there, so this does appear to have an, an onboard LED driver. Uh, and again, it's nothing special. These are 450 volt capacitors because they're handling rectified mains. So the mains comes in, it's rectified to DC. Uh, because mains is 240 volt RMS, it comes out as about 320, 340 volts DC. So you need appropriate capacitors to handle that. Uh, so that's why they're here. Uh, but this is part of the fairly typical LED driver. The kind of LED driver you'd have in, um, do I still have it here? In the floodlight that I managed to blow up. Here we are. There's the kind of driver chip you might have to pull it out of the bin, excuse me. You might have a device like this, and these would be those LED driver chips. Uh, 
But why is it in here when this is not generally directly driving LEDs? I had a look at the installation manual for this and that didn't quite hint at what's happening. Uh, but I will continue my research into that and see if we can work out why there's a LED driver circuitry in here when it appears that normally it would use external LED driver circuitry. And even if it did use this LED driver circuitry, I mean, it's 54 volts, it's 110 milliamps. Uh, that's not very much. Um, so what's that? It's uh, about five watts. So you get a five watt LED out of that. Uh, and you think, well, that's not going to do much for you, is it really? So unless something interesting is happening here, I don't know why that's got that LED driver there. Uh, so that's it. I mean, the only other interesting component is this uh, this device here. This is a, a, a super capacitor. When we say super capacitor, I mean, it's not really very super. Look at the specs on my side. It's 3.6 volts, 0.22 farads. I mean, 0.22 farads is, is quite a lot, but it's supplying 3.6 volts. And you can see the connections to this. It's uh, the, the negative side is here, the positive side is here. And the connections go to the RFID NSC chip here. Uh, that's potentially storing some data there and to the a flash memory here. So all that's doing is supplying power to these devices here. So that in the event of a, a power failure, then you get some power here so they can finish what we're doing and potentially store some data during a power failure. Uh, as, as I said, there's people who claim that these 450 volt capacitors are not standard components and that the uh, super capacitor here is going to zap you with high energy. I uh, gosh, it's uh, look how big it is. It's uh, I, this is my pencil to compare. It's 3.6 volts, 3.6 volts, yeah. And the devices here, these capacitors, they are six. Oh my gosh, they're, they're 6.8 microfarads. Right, that's barely enough energy there to, um, and it'll barely give you a zap if you touch it. And it, it's barely enough energy to sort of make a bit of water frazzle. Uh, so these claims that this is some kind of weapon device, I mean, it, it's just mad. Uh, one, because you buy it on eBay. And I'll put the listing here, here's a listing. There, it's a, oh, it's there on eBay. Uh, you can buy them if you like. And these 450 volt capacitors here, let's have a look. Uh, I'll just reach over here and pull something here apart. So this is a, an LED light here, and this is an LED driver circuit here. Let's have a look at this LED light. Uh, so there we have a 400 volt capacitor in this light. Uh, and the, the claims that that is not a standard component. Well, it just is. It's uh, you know, it's in lots of devices, as you can see on some of my other videos. Uh, so there we are. That's the teardown of this device. We've seen how it works in this block diagram. If there are any parts you'd like me to delve into with a bit more detail, then do let me know in the comments below, and I will do so, and we'll uh, we'll trace what we can on the board here and see what we can find out. The next protocol is what I'll do is I will sever the track here that connects the switch here to the antenna and I'll put some RF cabling onto the antenna which I have just over here there we are <clears throat> like I'll put this onto the antenna uh, so then I can connect the antenna to the antenna pattern test rig and we'll have a look at the claims that this is a some kind of high directional antenna with uh, lots of gain in that direction there where the, um, the missing bit is and we'll find out some of the characteristics of the antenna. Uh, but that's about it for now. And um, I think I'll put the antenna analytics into a separate video. So there we are. That is a Telenza lighting controller mode, which does exciting things like turn your lights off and it can dim them as well. Uh, with no zappy zap zap zaps. Sorry to disappoint.